welcome back after the break. Let us start uh, this uh, post break session with questions from all of you. And after uh, taking questions, I am going to uh, move on to another uh, topic, which is uh, distributed data stores or no SQL databases as uh, certain people call them. And I will be basically exploring how to store data at really large volumes. We saw before how to analyze data at really large volumes, but how to store it. We saw how to store data in a file system very briefly, but that is just one way of storing data. You want a data storage system to give you more flexibility and to do other kinds of things. And that will be the focus of the first part of the, this session. And after that time permitting, I will talk a little bit about uh, information retrieval. Now, the original uh, schedule for uh, this day had several other topics, which included uh, data mining, warehousing, XML, uh, object uh, oriented and object relational databases and so on. Uh, the reason we switched to this is uh, because we got feedback from many people that uh, they wanted new stuff. Uh, this uh, material, which I had planned to cover originally, but in the end I did not, is stuff which is probably not going to be in a basic database course, but it is material which many people use in an advanced database course. Now, of course, compressing all of that into three hours is probably neither here nor there. It needs a completely uh, different course to cover those topics. So, uh, I decided not to uh, squeeze it into here. Although, uh, information retrieval is another area like parallel processing, which is seeing some very interesting things happening. And uh, if time permits, I would like to say a little bit about what is happening in that sphere. And the other reason I would like to do it is because, it, as far as I know, it is not in the syllabus of most places as of now. So, it is something which uh, may be new to you and may be interesting. Okay, so let's start with uh, questions. Uh, if you have questions, please indicate it on uh, a view. Right now, I see that uh, Samrat Ashok Vidisha has their flag up. Samrat Ashok, oh yeah, thanks, sir. My question is that: Is there a probability to generate a spurious tuple when you perform repartitioning on parallelism? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, when you do repartitioning. Is it possible for your data to get corrupted and you generate some spurious tuples or other spurious data? This is actually a very interesting question. So, if you look at uh, specifications of disk drives, they will tell you what is the expected rate of uncorrected bit errors, meaning um, there are bit errors which happen when you transfer data from disk drives. Checksums will catch most of those errors, but a checksum itself is a few bits. Now, if if it is 32 bits, um, then there is probably 1 in 2 power 32 possibility that a checksum, a, a, a bit, some uh, unintended modification is not actually caught as an error because of checksums. Now, in an era when uh, disk was a uh, few hundred megabytes, uh, you know, first of all, most of the time there are no errors, and when there are errors, a 1 in 2 power uh, 32 chance seem to be perfectly fine. Similarly, when you have data in memory, most of the time memory does not get corrupted. The probability of a piece of memory getting corrupted is again very, very small. But when you talk of memories of the scale of many gigabytes, it turns out that if you have a few gigabytes on your machine uh, due to random uh, you know, alpha particles hitting your memory or so on, uh, that is most probably a few bits corrupted on your machine sitting here. You do not notice it most of the time. You know, most of the data sitting there is not critical. If a bit gets flipped, nothing dramatic happens. It is not often, uh, but it can happen. So, these two trends put together, increasing disk and memory sizes and uh, you know, pro data processing, which loads so much of data, has now increased the chance that if you load data from a file, you are going to have an error which you do not catch. So, in fact, today uh, the new generation of file systems is handling uh, data, uh, you know, error detection in a new way. They do it from the storage device to the actual in-memory buffer contents in an end-to-end fashion. What do I mean by this? In the current era, the disk sector has a checksum which catches it, but your file system does not really do anything. If the disk says, 
this block is okay, the file system says fine, I am going to take it and pass it on. But in the process of transferring it over the network uh, during repartitioning, for example, something may get flipped. Now, when you send it over the network, again there are TCP IP packet checksums. So, again most errors are caught, but when you transfer enormous amounts of data, some errors are going to slip through. So, what is done these days is, uh, there is another level of checksum on top of everything which is going on underneath. So, there are file systems like ZFS, which was developed by Sun, now part of Oracle, which uh, keep extra checksums at the file system level. So, when you read data from whatever device, even if the device messes up, um, the file system will check the checksum after reading it into memory. If the memory messes up, it will be detected. After the data is read into memory, the checksum is computed and verified. If the memory has a problem, it will be detected at that point. So, it turns out that uh, this is a very important issue with large scale uh, systems. Uh, recently, my colleague, uh, Professor Saumen Chakrabarti, uh, he has been working on a large cluster which is provided by Yahoo and processing uh, web crawl. It is as web crawls go, it is not very big, it is half a billion uh, pages uh, in comparison with uh, Google which probably has 6 billion pages, but Google also has thousands of machines. We have uh, 40 machines which Yahoo uh, donated to us. So, on those machines he was running various processes and he found that his program would crash sometime and it looking deeper it turned out that there was a bit flip which happened somewhere in memory and um, as a result of which his program crashed. So, now he is actually going and changing his data structures such that a bit flip will have a small effect, but it will not crash the program. You may lose a little bit of data, but hopefully that will not be a disaster, but your data structure as a whole will not get corrupted. So, uh, it turns out dealing with errors is very important today in parallel data systems. I hope that answered your question. If you have a follow up, please go ahead. So, the short answer to your question is yes, it can happen. Any system which deals at this scale must have checksums and other things to detect it. Back to you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Sir, I want to ask that how the intelligent client locates the location when we have large number of machines. So, when you have a very large number of machines, how do you find the location of something? So, in the context of a distributed file system, first of all, uh, there is a master which records um, for each file, for each chunk of that file. The chunks are fairly big, 128 megabytes is typical. For each chunk, uh, which machine is the master for that chunk and which are the replicas for that chunk? All updates go to that master and then the replicas. Uh, get the copy from the master. As it is updated in the master, it is also propagated to the replicas. So, what uh, the client machines do? First of all, uh, they uh, get this data from the master. Now, in uh, HDFS, the master is a machine. In the Google file system, the file system directory information itself is part of the uh, file system itself. So, what that means is that data itself is distributed across many machines and the client does uh, two or three steps. First, it goes to a master to find the root of that directory structure. Then the next level, it fetches from whichever machine has what part it needs. From that, it finds out where the actual data is for whatever it needs. Okay. I hope that answered your question. If you have a follow up, go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot, sir. Okay. Over to you, sir. Anna Chennai, over to you. Good morning, sir. So, uh, let us assume the problem uh, that we are going to automatically index a large amount of uh, audio or video files. So, let us say a lecture files in IIT Bamboo, whatever you do in the full semester. Uh, during that uh, indexing process, uh, daily more files will be added to the corpus. So, if I am going to automatically index, what sort of memory management functionalities are uh, provided in Hadoop or any other technology so that my automatic indexing is uh, easier and faster on this? Okay. okay. So, the question is if you are indexing audio or video files, uh, what sort of uh, functionality is provided by systems like Hadoop when you do it in parallel? Hadoop does not provide any specific functionality for any specific task. It is a library which lets you parallelize whatever you are doing. So, if you have a way to analyze uh, audio or video files, that code can run within the map function. So, the audio video files could be um, 
you know on the distributed file system. Let us say there are many such files. For each file you have uh, it is assigned to one of the workers. Each worker will get multiple audio video files. The map function will be called on each of those files and you write the map function to do whatever uh, you need to do. Uh, if that map function requires you to uh, you know do a, a text uh, sorry a speech to text uh, voice recognition and so forth and then you do indexing well do it in the map function so what is what hadoop has enabled in this case is that uh, you can have all those thousand machines working in parallel on different files doing the indexing function whatever indexing function you have written hadoop itself does not have anything built in for any domain it's just a parallelization framework i hope that answers your question the first question is answered. My next question is, uh, if I do some kind of incremental indexing, um, will Hadoop um, have facility for those things? Why should I provide the entire corpus and do indexing better? Okay. So, the question was, if you want to do uh, incremental indexing, so you have already got an index. Now, you get a few more records which you have gotten. Uh, how do you in do it incrementally? Does Hadoop provide any support? Like I said, again, Hadoop does not know anything about indexing. It has no clue what is indexing. It is all your code. So, the question is, how would you write code to do in indexing incrementally? So, we already have an index. Now, there are some new records. How do you index them? Well, the first part, if you have a few new audio video things, how do you extract the uh, keywords from those for indexing? That is straightforward. So, if you have, uh, if you put all your new files in some directory and then uh, run uh, uh, MapReduce Hadoop on it. Uh, it can be told to access only the new files and to do the map function only for those new files. The next problem is uh, the reduce function, which takes these. So, the reduce function can actually integrate these into existing indices. Um, so, depending on how you do that, for example, uh, one way is you, uh, this gets into how the keyword indices are built, uh, but think of it as B plus tree indices. They are not actually, but if you think of them as B plus three indices and you are doing a load of a large amount of data, then you can simply scan the leaf nodes of the B plus three index and the new data in sorted order and do a merge and then build a B plus three bottom up again on that. So, when you are doing large incremental, uh, I mean when the increment is big, this is effective. When the increment is small, you just do a series of inserts into a B plus three and you are done. Um, so, depending on the index structure that they use. Uh, one of these uh, uh, solutions is adopted. I hope that answered your question. Okay, there are a few questions which came over chat. Let me answer them. Um, the first question is, how can we recover the lost admin password of a database? Uh, this depends on the specific database. Uh, in uh, For most databases, what they do is, if you log in to the account which uh, kind of owns the database files, for example, uh, Oracle would be installed with some Oracle account, Postgres. Uh, so, let me repeat what I said. The first question is, how do we recover the lost admin password of a database? And the answer is, uh, databases usually have an account from where they were created, like the Postgres account, which is created automatically for Postgres. Now, if you log into that account, usually you can run the, uh, the PSQL in the case of Postgres or equivalent for Oracle without specifying a password and then you can uh, change the password from there. Uh, the specifics vary by database, but this is what you can do for Oracle. Uh, this is a frequent occurrence because you create that admin password in the beginning, you forgot to write it down and you completely forgot it. Well, this is how you do it. Go back. Uh, if uh, For PostgreSQL, our instructions said how to set the admin password. If you forgot it, follow the same instructions after logging in as Postgres. And it won't ask you for the old password. You can just set a new password. Okay. The next one is: uh, Can you please highlight on Oracle Rack or DB2 parallel databases? So, uh, first of all, let me answer for Oracle Rack. So, Oracle RAC, or uh, I forget what it stands for, uh, but it's basically what is called a, in Oracle terminology as a cluster. Now, what is a cluster? It means different things, but if you are an oracle person, a cluster means a database which resides on a shared disk. What does that mean? There is a disk subsystem which could be a physical disk, but typically it is not a physical disk. 
it is really a, a kind of a box which has multiple disks, network interfaces and so on. That box does not actually execute any programs, it just acts as a disk. You can read a block from it, write a block to it and so on, it is a disk. That disk is connected to a number of machines, each of which can uh, read and write data from this disk. So, this is called a shared disk configuration. Now, these machines obviously have to cooperate. If uh, they start writing data to the same block of disk at the same time, there would be chaos. So, obviously, uh, the uh, software which Oracle has allows these machines to run in parallel, do computation in parallel and read and write data from the shared disk in parallel, but they have to coordinate on various things such as uh, locking and logging for recovery and so on. So, they have to cooperate, uh, but with cooperation they can uh, make sure that the shared data is not clobbered. So, this is a setting which Oracle introduced initially for uh, two reasons. One is you get some parallelism. So, there are multiple machines which can run in parallel, but the biggest motivation for introducing this was reliability. And what people realized is that machines tend to fail. Disks, once you put a RAID and so on, uh, the disk systems are less likely to fail. So, in fact, what happens is you get these boxes, uh, which have uh, multiple disks, multiple network cards and they tend not to fail. They are very reliable. They are not 100 percent reliable. Uh, which state was it? Some state in the US recently had a major problem with uh, one of these storage boxes, um, which uh, there was some flaw in the in the software used in that uh, storage box and uh, their entire state uh, website uh, driver licensing uh, number of applications of that state went down for several days. Some of them took uh, 5, 6 days to bring back up because they had all the data on their disk. Uh, they did not have a uh, proper backup strategy or what I do not know the details, but because this box failed, they were essentially shut down, uh, many parts of their administrative things were shut down for a few days before they recovered. So, um, anyway, that is a rare event. Uh, these boxes are fairly reliable. It is far more likely that the machines uh, which are running in parallel die. So, rack has uh, fault tolerance features, where if one of the machines dies, the other machines in that cluster can detect that this guy is dead and take over processing for it. Now, the data for it is in the shared disk. So, the data is uh, still accessible. It is not lost uh, or rather it is not inaccessible when a machine dies. So, that is uh, called shared disk parallel. Let me write it here, shared disk. Okay. So, example is Oracle rack. In contrast, the uh, highly parallel system with thousands of machines they cannot have a shared disk. I mean, just imagine one single uh, disk subsystem, which is accessed from thousands of machines at a time. It is just not scalable. So, if you want to scale beyond a few CPUs, you really need to move to shared nothing. And uh, even uh, less degree is shared memory, where you have multiple processors that share a memory. In fact, uh, some years ago, uh, all the CPUs on desktops were single core CPUs and a uh, shared memory system was something which was a server with multiple cores. Today, every one of uh, the new machines which is in the market today has at least two cores. As a result, everybody now uses shared memory systems, shared memory parallel systems. Shared disk is one level up where you have separate machines connected to a shared disk. Shared nothing is even the disk is not shared, there is just a network interconnecting them. So, uh, Oracle Rack has been used for many years for high reliability. Uh, I believe the Indian Railways reservation system, for example, uh, was based on uh, Oracle Rack. In fact, uh, before Oracle, uh, Oracle actually bought out uh, sim corresponding database system from DEC, and I think the Indian Railway system used that. That was the basis for Oracle Rack eventually. Uh, so, that has been in use by Indian Railways for many years now. Uh, how many years? I think 25 years. It is a very old technology. So, it has been around for a long time. Okay. So, DB2 parallel also has shared disk features similar to Oracle Rack. 
Can we run the next one is from RC Patel uh, Shirpur. Can we run the process of ETL separately in a parallel fashion to build a data warehouse uh, without using the tools available? Uh, can you suggest any simple way of doing it? Um, I think if you use an existing uh, ETL tool, uh, as you have pointed out, uh, you know, unless it supports parallelization, you can't do anything. But if you are building your own, uh, so it depends on what are the steps in the extract process. So if you are getting some data and you are doing some extraction, which is local, it is very easy to use MapReduce on it. Um, so the extract transform load, incidentally, uh, more recently, um, people are now talking of not ETL, of, for those of you who are not familiar with this terminology, uh, data warehouses get data from multiple sources. They have to extract the data in some form, uh, from whatever form it is. They have to transform it in certain ways by doing some joins to bring it into denormalized uh, form, uh, schema which is used in the warehouse and then load it into the warehouse. Uh, so, ETL were the three steps before putting it in the warehouse. These days, uh, people are talking about ELT, which is extract, load, and then you do all the transforms in the warehouse. One of the benefits of this is the transforms can now be done using SQL in parallel. The warehouse is already parallel, uh, the transforms can be done in parallel. So, only the extracts have to be done separately. Um, so, I do not know much about uh, support for parallel. ELT in tools, uh, so I, I cannot answer that question anymore. Next question, uh, NIT Varangal, is MapReduce model portable? Yes, it is very, very portable. The Hadoop implementation is on Java and you can run it on Windows, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on anything. Uh, I am not sure about HDFS itself, whether it runs on Windows, uh, but the core Hadoop library is Java, so you can run it on anything. I think HDFS also is Java based and I think you can run the same thing on any system that supports Java, but I am not 100 percent sure about that. But bottom line is it is very, very portable. In fact, if you think about it, because it is Java, the different machines that are there can be different. They do not have to be exactly the same and uh, if you have upgraded a few of those machines to a new version of uh, C library or whatever, it does not really matter. The programs are still Java. As long as the Java VMs are the same, they are okay. okay. Next uh, from NIT Suratkal, do we need to have the same operating system on all machines having a distributed file system? Aha, I almost, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, the two questions have come in nice sequence and my answer to the first previous one is almost an answer to this one also. So, the answer is, all the machines which are running the distributed file systems do not have to have identical OSs. They have to have identical software though. The distributed uh, file system, DFS software has to be identical across all of those. If those, if that software is different, there is no way they can cooperate. But one can be running Ubuntu, one can run uh, Debian. Uh, I suppose if the DFS software is general enough, it can even run Windows for all we care. If it is, if the software is good enough, the operating system is not an issue. Now, next one, DOE Axe Srinagar, is the distributed system an effective way of making a supercomputer? Yes. In fact, there was an era when uh, supercomputers were made with special chips, which could run much faster than uh, your uh, regular uh, CPU chips. They used uh, special technology, gallium arsenide, they had uh, cryo cooling, you had Cray computers, which had, uh, you know, chips which would run so hot that they needed a special kind of refrigerator with uh, freon flowing through tubes into the CPU and what not. They were very successful in that era, but how many of you have heard of Cray computer? I am willing to bet most of you have never heard of it, because that company is now dead. It is kind of alive, but it is no longer what it was. What happened? What happened was, um, the cost of making the Cray computers was enormous. The market was very small as a result. In contrast, the market for your high performance, uh, you know, Intel i7 chips or equivalent AMD chips is huge. Millions of people across the world use them. So, uh, with Moore's law, Intel has been able to 
put in functions that once were there only on Cray supercomputers. Those functionalities are now there in your desktop uh, CPU. So, what does this mean? It means that, uh, you know, you can no longer do anything special in some sense to make a CPU go faster than what your i7 does. You can make it go faster, but then the heat problem is enormous. So, uh, those of you who have seen this trend, Moore's law predicted that uh, the number of transistors per unit area would double every one and a half or two years. And that has been happening steadily. There was another thing which people misinterpreted as Moore's law, which is that the CPU speeds will also increase correspondingly. That actually kept happening for a long time. Moore never said it would happen, but it did in fact happen. Till about five years back, when CPUs first started hitting 3 gigahertz. Now, till then every year, we would go from you know 100 megahertz, 200, 800, 1, 1 and a half, 2, 3. Suddenly, we hit a wall. After 3 gigahertz, boom, nobody is going faster than 3 gigahertz. And the reason is that the heat generated by the CPU increases with the uh, CPU speed. And once you go beyond 3 gigahertz, the heat is so intense, people have calculated if you want to go even a little bit more, it will melt steel. And if you go a bit further, it will be hotter than the sun, which is of course ridiculous. You can't actually go that fast. If you melt steel, your chip is already molten. But the point is that uh, there are physical limits to speed, and that limit has been hit today. So, the only way to go is to have distributed systems. And today, all supercomputers are basically built using Intel or AMD or similar chips, and um, there are other companies making chips. So, all of them are built using these. And, uh, the biggest supercomputers today are either a few which are built by governments. China has one, US has several in its national labs. So, governments have funded them to do some scientific computation, or the only commercial ones which are comparable, maybe even bigger, are the uh, data centers at each of Google, Yahoo, Microsoft. Each of their data centers has tens of thousands of machines cooperating on a task. You can think of it as a supercomputer. Okay. Uh, last question, uh, suggest an open source GUI tool, which can be used in place of Visual Basic. Mm, that is a good question. If your goal is to build uh, client server uh, GUI programs, there are several. Uh, you can use NetBeans with uh, Java Swing and that has uh, GUI features. On the other hand, if your goal is to build web based applications, um, Microsoft uh, it's Visual Studio has had uh, GUI features, drag and drop for several years now. I think from 2005 at least, maybe 2003. Uh, in the Linux world, NetBeans tried. There was a project uh, called Visual Web, which was there in NetBeans, uh, which version? I forget. It was uh, included in an earlier NetBeans version, but it was very buggy. So, it has actually been dropped from the current NetBeans version. Eclipse does not have it. Um, some, I do not know if there is any open source uh, GUI tool for building web applications, meaning we have Eclipse which you have used to build applications, but can you drag and drop constructs in there like uh, here is a uh, table uh, for display, here is a user input. Can you do that? There is something called NetBeans Visual Web, but it is flaky. Uh, that is the only one I know of. Maybe there are other open source ones. There are a few other proprietary ones for the Microsoft world. There is something called Iron Speed, uh, which can do more stuff. Uh, there are uh, tools uh, like Ruby on Rails, which is not GUI, but it lets you generate certain simple user interfaces very easily. They are called CRUD interfaces. Let, let me write it down. So, what does CRUD means? Um, I think create, read, update, delete. Okay. So, they basically allow you to create uh, tuples, uh, read the tuples, delete them or update them, uh, but they are very simple interfaces. They do not have any semantics and they are not very useful for real life applications. 
uh, although they are better than uh, going in and typing SQL to uh, read or modify data. So, there are some non-GUI tools, but nothing which is really as good as the best GUI tools that are there. Okay, I will stop there with the questions.